Hello, and thanks for stopping by. London is full of squares. There's so many in fact, it's impossible to imagine a city without them. Some, like Russell Square, are built on a very grand scale indeed, whilst others provide a focus for universities and residential areas. Many squares are tourist hotspots, the names of which are recognised the world over. Out of all of these, one of the most intriguing is Pickering Place, which is generally regarded to be London's smallest public square. Size doesn't matter here though because what Pickering Place lacks in dimensions, it certainly makes up for with its long and fascinating history. Let's squeeze in there then and see what we can find. Pickering Place is tucked away deep in the heart of St James's, an area that's renowned for its luxury boutiques and exclusive gentlemen's clubs. This is the Reform Club for example on Pall Mall, where in Jules Verne's 1872 classic novel Around the World in 80 Days, Phileas Fogg accepts his globe-trotting wager. We'll be seeing a lot more about gambling later by the way. The entrance to Pickering Place can be a tricky one to find. This is it here, nestled in the middle of one of the area's most famous shops, Berry Brothers and Rudd on St James's Street, which happens to be Britain's oldest wine merchants. Once you've navigated this dark narrow alley, Pickering Place opens up to reveal itself. And it looks rather lovely doesn't it? Peaceful in fact, which is a rare thing in central London. As we'll soon discover though, things here were once anything but tranquil. Pickering Place can trace its origins all the way back to 1665. This was when King Charles II, who was no doubt still in a jovial mood following the restoration of the monarchy a few years before, granted the trustees of the Earl of St Albans a freehold on the land here. With this secured, the plot began to develop. Several dwellings were built and the fledgling square soon became known as Stroud's Court, after a fellow named Thomas Stroud who was an early resident. You can see Stroud Court referred to in this advertisement, which was published in the London Gazette in October 1711. It offers a reward of four guineas, with no questions asked, for the return of several stolen watches. Do you think the culprits took them up on this offer? At the turn of the 18th century, a woman known only as Widow Bourne moved in, and she set about establishing a business on the site, which is believed to be either a grocery store or a coffee house. When Widow Bourne passed away, a relative named William Pickering inherited the premises, and thus Stroud's Court became Pickering Court. It was changed to Pickering Place, which I think rolls a little better off the tongue, in around 1812. William continued to build the business, and when he died in 1734, his sons took over. They decided to focus on selling wine. Well, you would, wouldn't you? And this is how Berry Brothers and Rudd, as we see it today, began to take shape. To honour this history, Berry Brothers now sell a tawny port named in William Pickering's honour. Although its seclusion is what makes Pickering Place such an attractive little spot today, this trait once had quite the opposite effect, as its secret nature encouraged all manner of ne'er-do-wells to congregate here. The hidden courtyard provided the perfect venue for duelling, and many men who had beef with each other came here to fight for their honour, usually with an accomplice posted at the entrance to keep watch. It's often said in fact that Pickering Place was the site of London's last ever duel to the death, although if this is true, the names of those involved have been long lost to time. Another rumour is that the ultimate dandy and all-round trendsetter, Bo Brummel, was one such man who came to Pickering Place to settle a score. Mind you, legend has it that Bo also used to buff his boots with champagne, and that's something I really would love to be true. Dueling aside, Pickering Place was most notorious for its illicit gambling dens, which, probably quite appropriately, were nicknamed Hells. By the early 1830s, there were at least four such hells crammed around the little square, and these were run by four men, named Croft, Davis, Levy and Smeed. Who would you trust most out of that motley bunch? 
Well-heeled and often rowdy men with more money than sense would head to Pickering Place, therefore, to indulge in cards, dice games and roulette, with small fortunes being frequently lost in the process. The Hells usually open for business at 1pm, and gaming will continue well into the early hours of the next morning. Unlike more upmarket establishments, the Pickering Place dens offered only the most basic of food to their punters, usually just bread and cheese, although cheaply made gin, often laced with dangerous chemicals, flowed freely. Those knocking back such lethal concoctions were probably too far out of it to realise that the cards they'd been dealt were often marked. One story even claimed that a certain hell in the area employed a small boy to hide in the chimney, just above the fireplace, where he'd hold a mirror aimed in such a way as would enable his accomplice to spy on others' cards. Even if you weren't cheated by the house, the threat of being robbed by professional pickpockets, who were most likely in league with the hell's owners, was ever present in the small and volatile confines of Pickering Place. Newspapers at the time weren't shy in displaying their disgust at these dens of iniquity, in Pickering Place, every house is used for gaming purposes, wrote one journalist in 1833. Play table sharks nestle together here in rows, like thieves in the cells of Newgate. That same year, one gentleman, who happened to have recently chanced his luck in one of the parlours, wrote a candid letter to the satirist detailing his unfortunate experience. Sir, I was one of those infatuated fools who, with my eye open and a gang of thieves around me, was persuaded and imagined that I could win many at the gaming table. In order to make the experiment, I had the folly to suffer myself to be led into one of those infernal dens in Pickering Place. The result you may guess at. In a few evenings I lost everything in the shape of money I could call my own. On the last night of my visit, having been plundered of my cash, I was in the act of offering my watch as the last and only stake left at my command, when, unfortunately, I found it gone. To cut the matter short, I had been robbed of it in the room, and on my stating the fact to some of the officiating demons, they laughed and appeared to treat it with the greatest nonchalance. <laughs> The animosity generated by the lowly establishments in Pickering Place came to a head between 1833 and 1835 when they were targeted by a series of grenade attacks. The first of these audacious assaults took place at around 10pm on Saturday the 18th of June 1833 when a grenade was lobbed beneath a table. It was reported that the ensuing blast made a sound like thunder which was heard all along St James's Street. Unsurprisingly, this led to panic in surrounding homes, whilst a crowd of those who had been gambling in Pickering Place were seen fleeing the scene, some with their clothes burnt and torn. A curious twist in the case occurred on the 16th of June, when a letter was sent to the satirist claiming responsibility. Calling themselves simply a victim, this individual stated, I am not ashamed to say I was the person who caused it, and I did so in the desire to deter the infatuated victims from entering those dens of barefaced plunder. And I can only inform Messrs Croft, Davis, Levy, Smead, Morm, and all of the other confederated villains that this is but the first of a series of attacks which will be made upon them. The attacks did indeed continue, albeit a few years later. On the evening of Tuesday, the 7th of April, 1835, another explosion rocked number 4 Pickering Place. It was reported at the time that this was the third such attack in several months. In this case, the grenade was rigged up like a booby trap, having been fixed to the building's door and then tied with string to the railings opposite, which created a trip wire. This triggered as soon as someone had the misfortune to open the door. When the device went off, the entrance was blasted to pieces and many windows were shattered. It was a miracle that nobody was injured, and in the aftermath, placards were placed along St James's Street, offering a £20 reward, about 2500 in today's money, for any information. It was speculated that due to the knowledge required to craft such a device, whoever masterminded the deed was from a military background and that they most likely had been cheated at some points by the house. Despite this theory, it would seem the culprit or culprits were never identified. By the 1840s, perhaps in part due to all of those grenades going off, things seemed to have calmed down somewhat at Pickering Place, 
and it's now that we come to our next bit of this little square's intriguing history, the old Texas Embassy. For a period of 10 years between 1836 and 1846, Texas was an independent sovereign nation known as the Republic of Texas. Looking to bolster its status, the Republic sought to forge relations abroad and as such established two embassies in Europe, one in Paris and the other in London, right here beside Pickering Place. Housed above Berry Brothers, the Republic's London Embassy was short-lived, it was only in operation between 1842 and 1845. The Texans were slow in paying the rent on the property, and when they suddenly cleared out in 1845, they did so leaving £160 in arrears, which is close to £20,000 in today's money. This plaque, which commemorates the embassy, can be found in a passageway leading to Pickering Place. It was unveiled in September 1963. In November 1985, as part of the celebrations marking the 140th anniversary of the founding of the state of Texas, a group from the Anglo-Texan Society travelled to London, and whilst here they paid the £160 that had been owed. To lend the ceremony an air of authenticity, the group dressed in buckskin clothing and handed the cash over in replica money, so I doubt either inflation or interest were taken into account. Despite being small, Pickering Place has been home to several people of note over the years. One such figure was Lord Palmerston, full name Henry John Temple, who held the office of Prime Minister twice in the 1850s and 60s. This stone relief on the eastern side of Pickering Place seems to represent Palmerston, although there is some mystery about it as the sculpture comes with no plaque or explanation. It's certainly been here for many years, you can see it in this illustration from 1962 for example. If you know anything of its origins, please be sure to let me know in the comments. In the 1920s, the artist and journalist Kathleen Shackleton, sister of the polar explorer Ernest Shackleton, had her studio here. Then in later years, the author Graham Greene was also a Pickering Place resident. He used his location in his 1978 novel The Human Factor as the home of the character Colonel Daintree. His bedroom and bathroom looked out onto a tiny ancient court containing a sundial and a silversmith, we're told. Few people who walked down St James's Street knew of the court's existence. It was a very discreet flat, and not unsuitable for a lonely man. Thank you so much for watching. I'd be interested to hear your own thoughts on Pickering Place. Is it a place you've visited? And would you have braved one of its gambling dens? I love making videos that focus on London's hidden corners. If there are any courtyards or alleys you'd like to see covered, please be sure to let me know in the comments. As ever, thank you so much to all of you who support this channel. I simply could not do this without you. If you haven't yet subscribed to Rob's London, I'd appreciate it very much if you could please consider signing up. This will ensure you don't miss out on any future content, as well as helping the channel to grow. And if you do click the button, don't forget to press the bell icon too, as this will alert you whenever I publish a new video. You may be interested to know that I've written two books, The Knowledge, Train Your Brain Like a Cabbie, and Waterloo, The History of London's Busiest Terminus both of which are available from a number of online retailers. I also have an Etsy store, Rob's Online Designs, where you'll find an array of mugs featuring hand-drawn illustrations of taxis, tube trains, buses and so on. Links are all in the description. For now, thanks again friends, stay well and please be sure to stay tuned.